Take your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4, if you would. 1 Samuel chapter 4. I'm going to try to preach, move along, and uh, be mindful of time. I don't want to unnecessarily keep anybody here, but I also don't want to uh, don't want to bypass God working in somebody's life and somebody's heart this morning. So 1 Samuel chapter 4. Let me know when you get there, say amen. Amen. The Bible says, And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? The man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. The man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army and fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? The messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. There have been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God is taken. I want you to consider this morning what the ark is. What it is. What it represents. What it symbolizes. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate. And his neck broke, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy and he judged Israel 40 years. And then in verse 19, look what happened as a result now of the ark of God being taken. None of these things that are in the Bible are there just as a nice story and we go, okay, that's nice and then move on. The Apostle Paul tells us that these things are written for our admonition and our learning. They are there for our example. This is how God works. What's past is prologue. Take a look at what happened in the Bible. These things come back around again in your life. You're going to see them if you look for them. So his daughter-in-law Phineas' wife was with child near to be delivered when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead. She bowed herself and travailed for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not. For thou hast born a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken. And because her father-in-law and her husband, and she said, The glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. I want you to consider, we've been doing this now for, this is I think the fifth message I've preached on this, and, and I think this is going to be the last of them. What does the ark of God represent? It represents the overall presence of God in your life. Now I want to say to you today, <clears throat> before we go to the Lord in prayer, I want to say to you that whether you are saved and a born again Christian, or you are lost... God is still right now with you. Amen. If you don't consider that, you don't believe that, you woke up today breathing God's air. You ate breakfast out of food that God provided for you. You put clothes on that the Lord allowed for you to purchase with money from a job that God gave you. You are alive today. Your heart is beating because God is the one keeping it beating. God is the one who determines who lives and who dies. If you don't believe that, I can't help you. I'm trying to get you to understand that it doesn't matter how saved you are. It doesn't matter how lost you are. God is still with you. The Bible says that it rains on the just and on the unjust. Who had rain, rain on their house last night? Raise your hand. Everybody in Jefferson County, from the way I could see the radar last night, was laying there in bed and I looked out and I told Lisa, I said, I think, it, I, think I saw lightning. She said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. About 10 seconds later. Yep, that's what it was. Did you know that it rained on my house last night? 
rained on our neighbor's house last night and he's lost. I'm talking about the other neighbor, not Matthew and Paige. Okay. It rained on the people down the road and they're lost. Now I'm not talking about Sister Linda. But it rained on their house last night. God watered their garden. God watered their grass. God filled the grocery stores with food for saved and lost people both. God is with you. Blessing you. Doing things for you. Watching over you. Waiting for you to acknowledge Him. Can you imagine a scenario in life where God departed? And God said, I will no longer be with you. Though you cry, I will not hear. You say, I don't believe God will do that. God did it with Esau. Though Esau cried tears, God said, I will not hear. It will be a terrible shame for you to lose the presence of God in your life. And let me say to you, and I'll say this church member and I'll say this to lost people. We're all, all of us, taking advantage of God's world. How many times a day do we put something in our mouth that we say thank you? We put way more things in our, in our mouth than the thanksgiving that comes out of our mouth. Sometimes we'll go all day and not thank God for the life that He's given us. And yet God gave it. Why? Because He loves everybody. He loves you so much that He sent Jesus Christ to die. He sent His only begotten Son to take your punishment. That's how much He loves you. And He offers it to you every day. Has it in store for you every day. He blesses you. He, give, he gave you the sunshine today. He gave you the rain last night. He's given you work. He's given you money. He's given you food. He's given you a house to live in. He's given you clothes on your back. He's given you everything that you have, including the very life that you have. All the joy and happiness that you've ever had in life, God gave that to you. But I want you to consider what would happen if God removed His presence from your life. Okay? I want you to think about that. Think about what would happen if God left America. There's people out there that hate this nation's guts. Hate Americans. Some of it justified, warranted, some of it not. But they hate us just the same. If God left America, God's protecting this country. What would happen if all the churches closed up in Jefferson County? Locked the doors, left the county. God says, I can't do it. Did you know that Jesus himself, when he was on this earth, tried to minister to a certain group of people, can't remember who it was, tried to minister to them and left them for he could do no great thing there because of their unbelief. Jesus left an entire community because they wouldn't believe in him. They didn't want him there. So he left. How about, are there Ichabod churches? Raise your hand if you believe that. I hope it's not this one. And I hope it never becomes this one. Is God in your home? Is God in your home? And I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell it like it is. Even if you are lost, God's in your house. Turning the heat on, turning the air conditioner on. Putting the breeze through your house. Keeping the refrigerator running. Paying your bills. God's in your family. God is with you every day of your life. Even if you don't believe in Him. Trust in Him. Are led by Him. Even if you, don't, if you say, I'm not a Christian. Don't plan on being a Christian. Not interested in getting saved. Did you know God, God has been with Rose's brother all the days of his life 
So much, and the evidence was that Rose, when she found out he had cancer and was dying, she tried everything she could to get a witness and a testimony to that man's life. She even wrote him a letter. She said, she told me, she said, I'm not good with words talking to my family members. I get that. Family's the hardest people in the world to talk to. So she wrote her brother a letter and sent it to him for him to read. God was with that man till he drew his last breath. And then he had to stand before God in judgment. God is with you every day, even if you're lost. What would it be like if he left? Let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, help us, dear God. Give us understanding of your word. Father, I realize, God, that I am nothing and I cannot break open the minds, break open the hearts of anybody listening to me today. Whether they listen here or they're listening online or they hear the recording of it, whatever, God, I am incapable of convincing anybody of anything. You, however, are God. You can break us. You can open up our minds and our hearts. You can tell us things, God, that maybe we don't want to hear, but Lord, we admit that you're right. Father, you can open our hearts. You can open our minds. There's not any one of us that you can't get to. But Father, it is clear and manifested, both by what we see every day and what we know in the Scriptures, that you give us a choice. You allow us to decide whether we want your salvation, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness of our sins, or we just want to be left alone, do whatever we want to, and then face the consequences. God, that is our choice, and you give that free will to us. Father, I pray, God, that you would convince someone like you convinced Nicodemus. As Jesus went to his home, sat down with him, talked to him, visited with him, told him that he must be born again, explained what that meant to him. Father, you're the one that changed Nebuchadnezzar's mind. Where when he saw the Son of God in the fiery furnace, he realized that there was no other God. Father, when he spent those seven years crazy as an animal, walking around, eating the grass, lapping up water like a beast. God, when his mind came to him, he realized that there was no other God but Jehovah God. God, if you can do that with kings, God, if you can do that with the working man, you can do that with anybody. But God, you give us the choice. Lord, I would hate, God, for you to leave me and your presence not be with me every day, Lord. Whether I'm right with you or I'm not right with you, God, you are still there. And God, I thank you for that presence. God, open up our eyes. Help us, Father, with your word today. Bless and honor your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. What was taken away? There's the Ark of the Covenant, or a facsimile of the Ark of the Covenant. It was a chest. It was a box. That box represented God's mercy, represented God's throne. It was where the blood of atonement was applied. We preached on all these. Inside of the Ark of the Covenant was a copy of the Bible, the Word of God. When God's glory is taken away, God takes away all of these things. The last thing that I want you to consider today is God's covenant. What is a covenant? Take your Bible, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. If you did not bring a Bible, there's one in the pew. They're all same King James Bibles. They better be. That way, when I read something out of the Bible, you're not going, well, my Bible don't say that. If your Bible don't say it, put it down, grab one of those in front of you. All right? Or grab one out of the lap of somebody sitting next to you. Or just look up at the screen. Deuteronomy 31, verse 24. And, when it, and it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. Now I want you to get this. 
We talked about this last Sunday. The, the words of a book. That was like a, a picture, a representation of the Bible. But it was, it was more than that. It was the covenant that God was making with Israel concerning the land that He promised to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm going to show you what a covenant is. But He was writing the words of the law until they were finished. Verse 25, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law, put it in the, in the inside of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. For I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, you have been rebellious against the Lord. And how much more after my death? So that he, Moses wrote everything down that God said. It was God's law. And it will listen to me now. It was God's conditions for letting them live in the land that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen to me. God has certain conditions. For those of you who want to go to heaven when you die. God has conditions that must be met. And I'm going to show you that. I looked up what a covenant was. And I was reading this. This is from Wikipedia. Here's how they define what a covenant is. A covenant is a type of contract in which the covenantor which in this case would be God, makes a promise to a covenantee, or a coven, covenantee. Did I say that right? Covenant. Everybody say covenantee. See, it's not easy, is it? The covenantee is Israel, or the covenantee is you. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Do you want to go to heaven when you die? You're the covenantee. There are conditions. And if there was not any conditions, God would not have given us this book. This book, here's the old covenant. And over here is the new I turn right to Matthew chapter 1. That's pretty good. Right here is the new covenant. There are terms and conditions. And if there was not then we would not have this Bible. We would not have these churches. God would just let us go about like animals, doing whatever we want to, and then He'll give us heaven when we die. But that's not how it is. And you need to get that out of your mind. Because there's people out there, or maybe people sitting here today, I don't know, but there's people who have it in their mind that they can live however they want to, do whatever they want to, forsake God, have no thought of God in their life, even though God's with them every day, think nothing of Him, and that God somehow owes them heaven. I cannot tell you the number of times I've attended or presided over a funeral service where somebody was in that casket, lost, died and went to hell. And the people surrounding the casket, oh, he's in a better place. Oh, he's in. Oh, he's at rest now. He's at peace. He's in a better place. Based on what? If you live, listen to me now. If you personally live in anything other than a hole in the ground somewhere, you sign an agreement with whoever you wherever. If you live in a trailer house. You signed a contract with the man who sold you the trailer house. Terms and conditions. If you rent, then you signed a contract with someone that gave you terms and conditions for living there. And if you don't obey those terms and those conditions, by the law, he has a right to throw you out 30 days. How many of you know that say amen? If you bought a house... And land, you sign a mortgage deal with somebody. There were terms and conditions. Who in here lives in an area like a subdivision or a community or something like that where there are community standards that you had to agree to before you could build a house there or live there? Who in here has something like that? A couple of you. Okay? Like you can't build a, 
a certain barn. You can't have old junk cars out in front of your house with a bunch of dogs having puppies in them all the time. You have to keep your grass mowed. Things like that, right? If you live in town, the city has terms and conditions upon you living. You cannot let your grass grow. Living in town, they'll come by and say, you got, you got to mow your grass. Am I telling you right? That's what a covenant is. The covenantee to do what's called an affirmative covenant in real property law, the term real covenants is used for conditions tied to the use of land. In property law, land-related covenants are called real covenants and are a major form of covenant, typically imposing restrictions on how the land may be used or, watch this, and I have it underlined, requiring a certain continuing action. That's called an affirmative covenant. I've read this last night and I'm just going, good grief, that's it. God made a covenant with his... In fact, look at this. Look at this. Exodus 6, 4. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan. Look at that. The covenant that God offered Israel was a land flowing with milk and honey. When the 12 spies came back from looking at the land, they brought back a, a cluster of grapes that was so huge... They had to, the two guys had to hoist it around on a, on a stick between them. They had this big limb and they put that, uh, cluster of grapes on there. It was so big, two guys had to carry it around and they brought it back and said, this is the kind of stuff we saw in that land. Woo! That's good land! God said, do you want that land? Yes! There's terms and conditions. I've given you my law called the Ten Commandments. If you abide by my law, I will let you live in this land. If you do not abide in my law, I will send enemies in and they will force you out and other people's going to live in your house. Heather, you're back there nodding your head because you just signed your first lease agreement and you know exactly what I'm talking about. No wild parties, 3 o'clock in the morning. Don't have a bunch of dead, beat up cars sitting out in the front yard. Don't have a bunch of trash laid out everywhere. No bunch of stinky dogs messing up the carpet all over the place. You signed the agreement. And the agreement said, pay the money, keep the place clean, and keep doing it. Are you listening to me? That was the covenant that God made with Israel. We have a new covenant now called faith. That faith is a continued action on our part. You want to go to heaven? You don't have to mow the grass. You don't have to pay the rent. You don't have to keep the place clean. You don't have to do anything except... Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It's called faith. For we are saved by grace through faith. And the land that God offers us is eternal life in heaven. But you must qualify and agree to the terms of the covenant. Are you listening to me this morning? Turn in your Bible to Exodus chapter 24. Here it is in print. By the way, Heather, bless your heart. Where you moved, the guy didn't just say, all, oh, you can pay the rent when you want to, and we don't need a big lease agreement. We'll just, I'll just say, pay the money first of the month, you move in, and we'll just kind of keep it like that. And any rules and regulations, I'll tell you as you go along. He didn't do that, did he? How many pages was your lease agreement? Do you remember? More than one? Three? Four? Your mama said, go home and read the lease agreement. Amen, mama? Read, read the lease. Okay? But a covenant is written... Do not come into an agreement with anybody over any large sum 
without it being in writing. Don't shake hands with somebody and trust them. They don't trust you. Why should you trust them? Exodus 24, verse 3. Moses came and told all the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said will we do. You know what that was? That was Israel signing the covenant. They agreed to it. Listen to me. God's covenant with you, that, that He makes with you, you've got to agree to it. Don't give me this nonsense. Well, I believe everybody goes to heaven. They believe in some form of God, don't they? No, it's not like that. You can't just believe in whatever you want to and then God give you what amounts to His property. He's In my Father's house are many mansions. Christ wants to give you the best place to live in the world. But there is an agreement that you must make. And Israel said, all the words which the Lord has said, will we do? And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. You got it? The covenant must be written down. For those of you who have not read your car rental agreement, or your house mortgage agreement, or the, uh, the terms and conditions of the software that you installed. You never read that? Do you know that you agreed to let them read all your stuff on your computer and sell it? Amen? You know what I suggest to you? Read the agreement. Read the terms and the conditions. That God sets forth to you before you say, oh yeah, that's what, that's what I'm going to do. Do you know how many people, Linda Carmichael, you know how many people we have seen come in, in and out of this church, having said, oh yeah, I want to be a Christian. Oh, I want to serve God. Oh, I want to do this. Gone. Never come back. I suggest you read the conditions. Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill. Twelve pillars according to twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. Moses took half the blood and put it in basins. Half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant, read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. They, they didn't just sign it. They signed it twice. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Have you not ever heard of a blood covenant? I was watching a, a, a film the other day. I can't remember what it was. But these, even these Japanese guys, they were signing an agreement of some kind and they pricked their finger and put their blood over their name. I said, That's our seal. That's our covenant. That's our mark. People used to cut their hands and make an agreement in blood. And I want to tell you something. There was blood spit. This Bible and this covenant is a blood covenant. It was Christ's blood. Somebody say amen. Now watch this. Deuteronomy 29. Turn there. Deuteronomy 29, verse 23. There was a pro I don't have time to get into all this. God swore in Deuteronomy 28, If you abide by my covenant, I'll let you live in the land. If you don't abide by the covenant, I'm going to send some people in. They're going to run you out. Deuteronomy 29, here's what God said He was going to do to the property. That the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning that is not sown, nor beareth, nor, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth thereon, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboam. Did you know that they found the place where Sodom was? Do you know who lives there? Nobody. Nobody's lived there since God burned it down. Now you listen to me. Those people were so wicked and so vile, God said, they're not living on my earth. And God destroyed them utterly. It's the same God, people. You want to live, you want to live on this earth? And yet, you don't want God anywhere near you. Let me tell you something. This is God's earth. He made it. He owns it. He's the land 
Lord of lords and the King of kings. And if God says, I don't want them here anymore, they're out. So he says in verse 24, Even all the nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done this unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? That's what you were saying when you were driving down the street one day and you saw all these people's stuff sitting out by the, by the street because the landlord issued an eviction notice and they wouldn't get out. So he went in with the police there and took all their junk out of his house and put it out on the street. And you'd say, well, what did they do to get thrown out? Look at this. Verse 25, Then men shall say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers. God has a covenant with you to live on this earth. It is God's earth. You want to break the covenant? You break the covenant. You'll take the consequences. God's a loving God. God has allowed, God has allowed you to... St Listen to me now. God has allowed you to stay on this earth rent-free. Never ask for anything from you. You despise the covenant. For they went and served, verse 26, they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom they had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. I want to show you something. I want to skip some of this. Turn to Psalm chapter 50. Psalm chapter 50. I'm going, to, I'm going to close with this. Preacher Ken Goff and I, years ago, went out visiting. We went to a man's house, sat down and talked to him a little bit. <clears throat> I'll never forget it. Went to a man's house, sat down with him, talked to him a little bit. And he said, me and God have our own thing worked out. You know what that means? That what, he's, what he was thinking was... I wrote up a different covenant between me and God. God lets me smoke dope, drink whiskey, chase women, go fishing every weekend, party until I pass out, and I do good things every now and then, and God will let me go to heaven. I... This is what he said. I am closer to God in a boat with a fishing rod and reel in my hand than I am in any church. That's what he said, Ron. You know what happened to him? He ended up a long time later coming to this church giving his life to the Lord Jesus Christ forsaking the old covenant that he drew up because God never agreed to it and he knew it and I'll never forget that day that I went to go see Steve Leonard that's who it was it's the first time I met Steve before I met, before I met Lisa it's the first time I met him and he said, me and God got our own thing worked out. And he later realized, God never agreed to that. Let me show you that from the Bible. Psalm 50 verse 14, offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. How many, how many of you have been in trouble and you got out of it? Did you know God got you out of that? That was even before you were saved, God got you out of that. Verse 16, but unto the wicked, God, God saith, 
What is thou to do to declare my statutes or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Because what happens when you take God's covenant in your mouth, you rewrite it so that you make God bow to your terms and conditions rather than you getting with God's terms and conditions. And I'm here to tell you, there's a man I met that would tell you, if he were here today, he would tell you, it didn't work for me. And it won't work for you either. And he's in heaven right now. Seeing thou hatest, listen to me, seeing thou hatest instruction. You know what that is? I don't like going to church, that preacher preaching. I don't like that. He preached out of that Bible and I don't like that. I just... See, you hate instruction. You castest my words behind thee. You don't care about it. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him and hast been a partaker with adulterers. See, that's who you... Listen to me. That's who you really are. You're a thief. You're an adulterer. By the way, the church house is full of them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thou givest thy mouth to evil and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done and I kept silence. You know what God's saying here? I put up with your nasty, sloppy sins for a long time, haven't I? John, how long God put up with you? 35 years? Who in here has got him beat? Oh, my. Roy, how many years? 40, 40 years falling down drunk. And God kept silence. God didn't say a word. God was good to you that whole time. Verse 21, these things hast thou done and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. Did you see that? You think God. I heard a, a preacher went to this guy's house. Guy was sitting up on the porch drinking his beer. Preacher went up there and he said, hey, preacher. You want some Budweiser? Preacher said, no, come here and talk to you about your soul. Well, sit down here. And preacher talked to him for a little bit. And he said, what would you do? Preacher said, what would you do if Jesus came right here? I'd offer him a Budweiser just like I did you. Ha, 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 ha. It ain't funny. Because you think God is a nasty, sloppy, foul mouth, drunkard, adulterer, sinner. That's what you think God is. You think God is just like you. And God will put up with your sins and God will take you in no matter what. Let me tell you something. There are terms and conditions. You want to talk about clean? God is a clean God. You know what God says to do? Before you come in my house, you better be clean. Thou thoughtest I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. That was God talking. That was the God that you said, let you do whatever you want to do. That was God talking. Who was he talking to? He's talking to me. He was talking to me. He was talking to my wife. He was talking to her mom and dad. He was talking to my daughters, my sons, my sisters. He was talking to everybody in this church house and he's talking to you. Do you think that you're any different than anybody else sitting in this church. Because they'll tell you they're just the same kind of sloppy, nasty, dirty, foul mouth, nasty, hell deserving sinner, just like everybody else is. They better tell you that. Preacher will tell you that too. I deserve hell and I deserve it hot. 
And God plucked me out of the fire. And God said, you want to come in my house? Then I get to clean you up before you come in here. Did you hear those amens? That was from people that God had to clean up. If you think that you can't do it, you're right. This is where the faith comes in. Because only if you believe that God is the only one who can change your life and clean you up and let you into heaven, that's the faith that we have. It's not in us. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. I promise you that. I want to ask you to bow your head. I'm going to ask you this morning, those of you here, those of you listening online, those of you listening to the recording, I want you to consider now that contract that you made with God. And I want you to consider the fact that God never agreed to it. He never agreed to it. God offers you now a better one. And trust me, it really is. And what, what God will do is, instead of letting you live how you want to live, God will just change your mind on how you want to live, and all of a sudden you don't want to live that way anymore. Let me hear some people say amen to that. That's what God did. He started changing their mind about things and changing their heart. And all of a sudden, they didn't want to keep doing the things they were doing. They wanted their life clean. They wanted their life right. They wanted to be obedient. They wanted to say to God, God, everything that you said in your word, I'll do. If you'll help me. So I'm going to ask you this morning. And I'm just I'm going to do it this way. If you're here this morning and it's time for you to tear up that old contract, I want you, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to call upon the name of the Lord. You don't have to do it out loud if you don't want. You can just do it, just you. If you do that, would you come tell me about it after the service? See, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm not trying to make a big deal about it, how things. And I think when God's ready to save somebody, He saves them. It doesn't take. It doesn't require me getting involved in it. But the Bible does say, "Let the redeemed of the Lord say so and make witnesses." And so, if this is what you do, then I want you to tell me about it. But with your head bowed and your eye closed, I want you to ask God. to help you with his new covenant, his new contract. You want to go to heaven when you die. You do not want to go to hell and you're headed there now. And God wants to annul your agreement with death and hell. Because you've got one made out right now and hell is going to be where you're going to live and you're not going to like it. So God is ready to annul your contract with death and hell and he's ready to offer you a new covenant that will give you life will you accept it it's that simple will you accept it heavenly father i pray lord for everybody lord that's hearing me god i cannot do lord what you can do in their lives lord i've laid out the word i've tried my best i'm asking your holy spirit I'm asking Jesus to go in their life and open up what we can't open up. He's standing at the door and he's knocking. If any man will open up, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. That's what your word says, Jesus. And Father, I pray, Lord, that right now somebody somewhere is tearing up their old contract with God, asking God to Give them the new covenant. Lord, bless you and honor your word in their heart today. I pray, dear God, that those, Lord, who've called upon you today, Lord, would let me or somebody know. 
pray, dear God, that you would bless them and walk with them and not forsake them all the days of their life. And Lord, help them to continue, Lord, in that covenant with you. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said.